welcome back to the second hour of our program. On the line with us is, is my buddy, Dean Obidala, the host of the Dean Obidala Show, weekdays 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Sirius XM Progress Radio Channel 127, a columnist with CNN.com, contributor to the New Republic. His website is deanofradio.com. And on Twitter, you can reach him at Dean Obidala, O-B-E-I-D-A-L-L-A-H. Dean, welcome back. you got a, a great new piece in CNN. Uh, dot com titled uh, Republicans just gave the country a master class on extremism. We've been uh, discussing this over the last hour. In fact, we had, you know, a guy call in going, well, Trump and, and Bernie are just the same thing. You know, we can I can vote for either one of them. Uh, how you doing, Dean? What do you think about all this? I, I'm doing fine, although it's interesting. When I used to hear that in 2016, Bernie or Trump, it didn't make sense to me because we understand the nuance of what Bernie's about and what Trump's about. But if you just said want an outsider who you believe is sincere and will give a middle finger to the establishment if need be, I could understand years ago why you could think now you, there's nothing. They're not in oh, yeah. any way the same at all. I knew the time in 2016. I don't, I don't understand it either. But now I, I understand only then, not now. They're not. Yeah, in, in 2016, Louise and I were living on a boat in at the, uh, the Capitol Yacht Club in, in um, Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, a good chunk of the people who lived in that marina and the, and the marina next door as well, which we had lived in earlier, the Gangplank Marina, were, uh, you know, uh, either military or retired military. And, you know, I, we got to know a number of them quite well. And, and several of them, uh, and some who weren't military, but just, you know, just people who lived on boats um, in that primary, were just right up front that it was either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. They would, you know, if they, if they were registered as a Republican, they'd vote for Trump. If they were registered as a Democrat, they'd go for Bernie. Either one was fine with them because they were just sick and tired of same old, same old politicians. And, you know, it, yeah. it, it made a certain sense at the time. But, yeah, I, I think in retrospect, we know a lot more now than we knew then. Certainly. And, and if you were looking for the fascist candidate, now you got it. Now yeah. you got the GOP We've got fascism in America. And that was sort of the point of my article, Tom, because a lot of people were rightfully talking about Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott. Ron DeSantis dehumanizing Latino human beings. Let's not forget migrants sort of sanitizes their humanity. They were human beings, and Ron DeSantis didn't care about them. But in that same week, my point was in just seven days, look what the GOPs delivered us, and it's not an aberration. And you had that Indiana and West Virginia enacted total bans on abortion at day one of conception. So if you're a woman in Indiana or West Virginia, on day one of conception, your uterus becomes property of the state. Very few exceptions. You had Ron DeSantis, Greg Abbott, you had Donald Trump embrace openly QAnon, then he had his rally on Saturday night where they played a QAnon music and had introduced a new one-arm salute to Donald Trump and a election denier won in New Hampshire for the U.S. Senate nomination. So you had all of the GOP in one week, embracing violence, election denying, the cruelty, dehumanization of a minority group. This is what fascism looks like. It's every characteristic, Tom, and we've talked about this before. Just lay it out in front of your eyes. You can't look away. You shouldn't look away. Inform your neighbors. Wake people up. That's our job, Tom. It's not just to reach our audience. It's having our audience and us wake people up who aren't paying attention going, come on, even you agree this is not normal times. And then you can make the case about why it's really dangerous times. Yeah. I, you know, I remember I've been doing this show for almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years in March. And, uh, you know, I remember a time when talk radio was like, uh, hey, let's debate whether you should be able to use mace on dogs when you're jogging and they chase you. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like right. those days are gone. <laughs> it's like I oh, the country's might, on fire. On right wing radio, they might be debating, can you use mace on Democrats? You know, in the not too long future from now, because this is where we are. Tom, I think you made a great point, though. When you listen to Tom Hartman, who's a legendary radio host, who's telling you, this is not normal times. We've yeah. seen a lot in politics that you should wake up. Listen to Tom Hartman when he speaks on this, because he knows what he talks about. Yeah. Dean, what, what are you seeing uh, right now that, that you see as the principal threat? I mean, your, your article, basically, uh, about... Uh, Republicans giving the country a master class on extremism over at CNN.com. We're talking with Dino Badala uh, of uh, Sirius XM Radio. Um, what, what are the specific threats that, I, you know, as an attorney and, and obviously a talk show host, you know, somebody who's kind of at the, 
at the, the crossroads of American public opinion. You know, you get calls from all over the, as as we do. Um, <clears throat> what, you know, in particular legally, what do you see as the biggest threat to this country right now? Well, there's so much, Tom, that when you mention living on a boat, I'm like, that's the future for us, Tom. We'll be living on a boat somewhere doing our <laughs> show pirate Climate radio. change, in other words. Off, off the mainland. No, I don't know. I think the Republicans might drive us from the mainland here because we won't be permitted to do this. Look, the, the threat of this GOP, I think it goes way beyond election denying. These are democracy killers. You know, the Washington Post had a great article flying at over 60% of Republicans have won the nomination in battleground states in positions that will administer elections going forward. So you've got, right off the bat, you've got the loss of democracy. You have Donald Trump embracing the QAnon, the storm, which I think everyone knows the storm is, in their view, when Trump returns to power and executes his enemies like us. So right, that is the Civil War, saying. Dean. That is the Declaration that, that is right. of Civil so, War. So you've got, you've got that. You've got the one-armed salute. You have the celebration of cruelty going on by the GOP. It's hard to pick one or the other. I think fascism is a perfect descriptive word, and I think that it's, as Democrats, we have to start using it more and more because then we can inform people. Yeah, this it, is it what, seems, you don't know. Here it is, folks, right here. Yeah, that, that's the central organizing principle. Increasingly, is fascism, and and fascism uh, depends upon, and and as a Muslim, I mean, you've, you've certainly seen this. Uh, fascism, uh, you know, you don't often call it that in in, in other countries, but it, I would argue that it is. You know, it depends upon brutality or the perception of great strength. And that's so well put. And I think the common denominator in DeSantis, Greg Abbott, and Donald Trump, and Indiana and West Virginia enacting abortion bans is this, it's depravity, it's turning against the minority, which is a big characteristic of fascism. But to me, the most worrying thing for all, and I, and I hope people think about this for a second when when I'm done from speaking with you, if you're someone like they are on the right that would force a woman or a child who's raped to carry a fetus to term, if you're someone on the right that will celebrate the idea of having human beings looking for a better life, to use them as props and not even form the location where they're gonna be landing, that they're coming, that if you can dehumanize people to that extent, you can force people to carry the fetus for rapists, you're capable of anything. And I don't mean that in a good way. I mean in terms of crimes against humanity way. We have to wake up to what we're dealing with. I'm not saying we're going to get there, but you have to deny history not to see the troubling signs about the mentality of what we're seeing play out. It is much deeper. It's not political. And, and one last thing, Tom. Trump at his rally Friday and this week with the, last week with embracing QAnon, the storm, his rally playing the QAnon music. He's not, he's not on the ballot. He's not building an electoral support base. He's building an army. I think we have to be aware of it. Donald Trump is building an army, and it's going to be used, I think, if he's indicted. That's first and foremost. Beyond that, in 2024, just like history, this is using a paramilitary violent movement to help him win an election. Yeah. Have you, have you seen this new book? Uh, it's, it's a bestseller on Amazon now that, that says that, uh, you know, Jesus in, in the book of Mark uh, refers to himself as the son of man, uh, whereas typically in other places it's, you know, uh, they, he's referred to as the son of God. Um, and this book hypothesizes that Son of Man, when Jesus said that, he wasn't referring to himself. He was, he was referring to Donald Trump. And that Donald Trump is clearly the, the, the second coming of the Messiah. And, and it's, it's like it was like at 8,000 on Amazon yesterday, which is really good for a book. I mean, that means, uh, you know, they're selling probably 50 copies a day, which is just nuts. Um, but, but, you know, beyond your book is the one, your book on neoliberalism is the book people should be reading. Because Tom was on my show last week talking about neoliberalism in great detail. So that's the book people should be reading to understand the, the more of the nonviolent political mentality that got yeah. us in this well, place thank you, today. Well, thank you, Dean. But, but I, you know, I, I have, I, I have a, a serious legal question for you here. Um, and, uh -oh. you know, and Go we've ahead. got about two and a half minutes before we hit a break I can't control. Um, and that is, there is no law in the United States against domestic terrorism. I mean, there's laws against murder and there's conspiracy laws and things that can be used against, sure. you know, the Tim McVeighs among us. But there is no law against domestic terrorism that grants the FBI the kind of power that they have overseas or that the CIA has or other agencies have, you know, in dealing with foreign people or foreign people in the United States, foreign terrorist threats. Should and, and, and the argument up to this point, and mostly Republicans have been making this argument, which makes me suspicious of it, has been you don't want a domestic terrorism law because that then 
you know, just labeling people uh, strips them of some of their rights, and that's a slippery slope. What, what do you think about that? I, I don't honestly know what to make of this debate. It's a great debate because I've had people on the left, especially from communities of color, fear that, look, if you do this for the best of reasons, I can assure you it'll come back to be used against communities of color based on our history, and they're right. Right. I think at some point it will be used against Democrats, it'll be used against Republicans. Just so it's clear, we have all the laws needed to prosecute somebody for mass murder right now, mm -hmm. and the laws needed for terrorism in terms of violence against a building. We just don't have a penalty for domestic terrorism. We have a federal definition of domestic terrorism, and the Department of Justice has called January 6th an act of domestic terrorism that fulfills the federal law definition of it. There's no penalty for it. That's the difference. Look, if FBI needs more resources to investigate domestic terrorist threats, I would give it to them. But I still think we should all be, forget Trumpism, weary of government surveillance without having checks on it. So you need checks on it. As long as you have the checks and balances on it, you have oversight of it, it's fine. Uh, FBI, do they need more resources? I'm not sure. That, that's really the question. Yeah. They need more resources to do their job to keep us safe from, right now, it's right-wing domestic terrorism. Yeah. So would you define domestic terrorism very narrowly? I mean, if, if there's no penalty for domestic terrorism, if, you know, what if somebody isn't killed? I mean, at what point? They're just, they're just frightening, you know, the, 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 the kind of phone calls that people get and stuff like that. I mean, where, where do you draw the lines? Well, the definition for domestic terrorism is actually the mirror of the one for foreign terrorism. It's the same, like there's three different prongs in it, but it has to result in the serious bodily harm to someone or the death of someone, you're doing it to intimidate a population, to have a change in government policies, to coerce a population. I mean, it's really written out in the statutes. It's not sort of this kind of throw it around thing. It's very specific. So the definition is fine. And it does, January 6th definitely was an act of domestic terrorism. There's no dispute. That's not political. It was an act that fulfills all the elements. So, but there's no penalty for it. So it's just a nice definition we can talk about. It doesn't yeah, mean anything. I get it. Dean, always great talking with you. Thanks, Tom. Nice chatting with you as always. Thanks so much for dropping by. Dean of Radio.com. Dean Wobadala right here on SiriusXM, 6 to 9 p.m., Channel 127.